actually you have to slide like kind of a metal sheet underneath the sample and then I don't know, maybe you could describe it better. I haven't done it in a while. Yeah. And every time I've done it, I've messed up the core. So, yeah, we take a, it's for a baking, one of the measuring and cutting, I can't remember what they're called. I use it for baking a lot. But you take it and you slide it. So you slide oh, like it. a baking sheet. It's yeah. not, a, not a sheet, it's the, the portion thing that you cut it with. So you cut the dough with it. But you push the push, push the, sediment core up into a smaller tube mm -hmm. and then slide the cutting tool between the two or just slide the sheet between the two tubes and then you can remove the top five or the top layer or however much you want it to be and then slide that into a jar oh okay cool thank you uh and yes this is our last dive can we to get the a zoom then. on whatever this is go ahead yeah. I think I see nodes, so, okay. but I'm not completely sure. But if there were nodes, then that was a bamboo coral, or bamboo <laughs> whip. Oh, the baking tool thing is called a bench scraper. Yes. Oops. Oh, okay. Is this the same tool as when you go to like really fancy restaurants and they take it around and scrape off all the breadcrumbs in between the meals? Oh, no. <laughs> Quick zoom there, though. Okay. So this looks different. So this is not a bamboo. I don't think. Steve, if you're in the chat, I don't know what it is, but. Okay. Chrysogorgia? I think so. Oh, and looks like a sea urchin behind it, too. Yeah. Okay, so we're getting some more little whips of something. Do a fly by zoom on that whip there. Yep. Can you zoom in anymore? Thanks. <coughs> oh, it 
can't uh, get any tighter than that without landing. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Otherwise, it's just looking through a straw. Yeah, yeah. No worries. Okay. There's this new thing. To uh, fly by on him, Daryl. Okay, I don't see any nodes. So, wait, maybe I do. Okay. Yeah, I see some nodes. So this is a bamboo with a bunch of brittle star associates. Oh, there's a sponge. And the coral. Coral? I didn't even see it. Oh, there it is. Looks like another Chrysogorgia. Oh, and there's something squat lobster, perhaps? Something crawling in it. Okay, go away. We're gonna start moving a little quicker here, Coralie. We're up against the wall, so. Sounds good. Looks like there's another sponge in the top left corner. And a little sea star also. A couple sponges, another sponge on the ridge.
of that red wall of death approaching in the sonar. Wall of doom. Some red on the sonar, finally. What we like. Stretch it out a bit here. Okay, it looks like a sea cucumber or maybe, I don't know, maybe a sea star actually. Can't tell. Underneath. Possible slime star? Slime yeah, star. slime star. Yeah. Very thick slime star. Zoom in there, though. Okay. So to the ROV pilots, you can normally feel the current, right? When you're driving Herc or, or at Atlanta? Yeah. But how is, how is the current here? Do you feel anything? Mm, no. Not really. You can, <laughs> you can usually see by the tether. So the tether's coming off the back of Herc and going straight up. If there's a... Uh, significant current it's no more pointing it's current blows it away from her so it doesn't stand straight up like that yeah so you also can't really see any ripples in the sediment here which is why we're able to see the bioturbation so well and I have a feeling or I have a hypothesis that the reason why we're not seeing so many corals or so much life um, probably has to do with the fact that there's no current here. So if there's no current, there's nothing to bring nutrients to the organisms. Zoom in there, Daryl. Quick zoom. Ah. It's probably also why we don't see uh, that much from I'm manganese crust either. There. So like um, organisms... One more. The growth of ferromanganese crust is kind of dependent on bottom currents to wipe away sediment so that there's a surface for the crust to grow on. Okay, it looks like oh. some sort of, okay, a sponge for sure, and then it looks like a stalk of something old. Okay. Ooh, I like this tidbit from uh, an online viewer. So the creature in the movie Nope was actually based on a sea dollar and the big fin squid. And it was developed by Dr. Kel Kelsey Ruthledge. Fun Very tidbit. cool. Yeah, I like that movie a lot. Me too. 
We're probably good for 20 now, why not? Sure. Yes, please. I don't know what that is. We got, I think I might. Tunicate? Huh? Tunicate? Perhaps. Push in a bit there, there. I think it's one of those predatory tunicates that we've been seeing. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. Well, we haven't seen one for a little while. Yeah. Okay. Yep, we're good. Can you put uh, Atlanta and H11 there? How many rocks do we have? Two. So we had a question about how does a predatory tunicate predate? And of course, Brian or another um, biologist would be able to answer this question a lot more effectively. But uh, it's an ambush predator, so it kind of has that mouth open, and then when a small fish or crustacean swim by, um, it'll close its mouth and eat it real quick, digesting it alive. Okay, Brian's back so he can, okay, just kidding. He's not gonna do anything. <laughs> Maybe he can help me ID some stuff better. Okay, it looks like there's some sponges.
Corley, do you have a sense um, of what, in basalts, what causes these overhangs? Is this a mass wasting where the basalt is shearing off and falling, or is this structural formation to get this kind of overhang? I mean, it's uncommon to see, like, um, I think it's uncommon for, let me, like, figure out how to word this. It would be weird to see basalt just kind of slough off like this. I feel like this is probably some sort of mass wasting okay. um, event. Can we get a little bit tighter zoom on that coral? Sure, we go ahead there. Okay, is this a bamboo whip? That is my primary guess, yes. But I did not see any um, bands on it. But that should be good enough for to study with the image, uh, study the images later. That's one of the really um, valuable things about these high resolution cameras is being able to zoom in as well. Um, and I will certainly put a plug here for 4K too, because you can zoom a whole lot further into it after the fact and, and look at some of the detail. Acorn worm. Another acorn worm. And yes, to the left is a sponge, if you can see it. Oh, it's kind of in the center. For those online, we're currently diving at about 2,100 meters. All right. Good. Sea cucumber and brittle star on some whip of something. Oh, and another whip of something. <gasps> I think she can do a move to the north once. Roger.
to the uh, east here. Another sea cucumber. Lynette, when you have a second, would you tell us uh, the distance to kind of the next flat area and then the distance to the top of the cone? About there. Yeah. And if we were, what do you think would be the most northerly track we could make going west? I guess. <laughs> so what I'm, what, what I'm, we're, we're way ahead of schedule, and so we've got extra bottom time. And what I'm thinking about suggesting is that we get up to about that area about 400 meters further down track and then we move due east for a kilometer or something and then back up the hill on whatever the ha most happiest motion we could if we go come up to the 400 meters go due east for a kilometer or two and then back the ship um, back up the hill and get to waypoint six yeah, like move out there, and then how far would we have to go that way to get to a, a comfortable ship movement direction? Yeah, so we'd have to get like two or three kilometers that way, but in order to, okay, that's not gonna work. All right, thanks. Bring your head to the right sub for me. Yeah, that's a good idea. Maybe we'll maybe we'll do that. Um, yeah, let's continue that for a little bit. I'm really hoping once we get up closer to the top here, we'll pick up some more life, um, and then so maybe continue at zero two five and for another at least two hundred meters, um, and then we can reassess. Thanks. Yeah. These rocks are super blocky here. I don't think anything is going to be very easily grabbable. Can we zoom coral, please? Sure. Go ahead.
speed. This is actually a Primnoid whip. Yep. No, Steve agrees. It's Norella. Come up a bit, please. Definitely. You already do that one. The first one, or? Yeah. We talk, talk about that. Um, yeah, so the sh uh, question online, does the ship have a full-time chef or do we cook for ourselves? The ship does have a full-time chef. We have two um, and we have a steward uh, and they cook all of our meals for us. I get really spoiled out here. Yeah, they cook a lot of food for us. Um, but just one of the kind of nifty things about being a, a sea is all of the you know, normal trials and tribulations of life, grocery shopping, figuring out what to cook for dinner, everything is just handled by the ship. And so like it is a, you can, with the exception of having to do your laundry, more or less, you can be 100% immersed in the science, you know, for every minute you're awake, um, which is a really interesting and unique uh, experience to be able to not worry about any of the kind of life stuff and you can just really just focus on the science um, it's an interesting comparison when we think about telepresence and participating in these expeditions um, using telepresence from shore it's actually more difficult I've personally found it more difficult and more stressful to try and participate in in an expedition or deeply participate from shore because the life doesn't stop you know I still have you know my wife wants to know what time we're going to be home. I still have to run errands. Like, it's harder to divert, to really commit to the expedition um, when you're operating from shore. Um, I much prefer being on the ship, just because the expectation is that I'm at on the ship and no one, you know, thinks I'm going to try and keep up my normal life. Whereas trying to work um, through telepresence, people are always like, "But you're still here." Um, and they don't understand that you're trying to work on something in the ship's 24 hours a day. Uh, and if the, you know, if there's a problem or there's a weather, you're just on hold. Um, it's one of the kind of odd downsides or frustrations we haven't really overcome with how to use telepresence best. So the feature we're diving on today is a, um, a really large geo, uh, kind of as far east in U.S. waters as you can get um, in this area. And uh, we're coming up the southern side of it. This is our second dive of on this feature. Our yesterday's short dive with the laser dive bot was up on top um, in a... Uh, in what's probably a little bit of a paleo shoreline region, kind of in the center of the flat part of the geo. Uh, and now we're coming up the south wall. We're about 400 meters away from like the, 
the brake onto the top of the GEO, but this one, this feature has several secondary volcanism events, uh, remnants. And then we're going to do a little transition over probably uh, a flat spot and then climb back up a relatively steep uh, secondary cone. Um, and go ahead, Doug. And once we get a little bit shallower, we'll probably start zigzagging back and forth here to cover more seafloor uh, as we work our way up. So we're looking at kind of a bottle brush style uh, Chrysogorgia here, and it's got a, a Europtychus uh, squat lobster living in it. All right, thank you. Okay. And this is our last dive of the expedition. We'll be... As soon as we recover, we'll be heading home um, for what looks like will be a mildly bumpy three or three and a half days of driving north back to Honolulu. Couple brittle stars here. There's one of the kind of swimming holothurians sitting on the seafloor ingesting the sediment. The, the general transition here from the sediment, we've gone from the heavily bioturbated sediments to up here appearing to be a little bit less I see fewer feeding traces and fewer um, sediment eating organisms up here, macrofauna at least, which is con pretty consistent with what we've seen on uh, a couple other dives here. I would hope to start seeing some sand ripples maybe forming soon, indicating an increase in current, but we'll have to see. At least for now, everyone gets to see the cool botryoidal texture of Ferromanganese crust, except for these angular blocks right in the view. Just screaming, pick me up! Yeah, you I'll want any of those? Yeah, so honestly, yeah. yeah actually, actually this is, these are great candidates. Totally. Um, any of these. <laughs> that one, that one. I do. That one, any of these three. Got one of those rocks, man. I think this is the most angular cantaloupe shaped rock I've ever seen on this expedition. <laughs> we need to so. get Adam a t shirt. <laughs> I don't know exactly what it would say, but something about <laughs> angular cantaloupes. So I took a class, or a seminar class with Adam, um, which was more in his field of study, which is kind of physical volcanology. And it right, was a class. Right in. Yeah, right Okay, in. I'm enabling. Uh, it was a class with mostly geochemists. And one thing we all struggled with was how these like physical volcanologists will just make up whatever name for whatever they're seeing. And it's like, well, what is this? About? There's no definitions of it anywhere. And he was like, yeah, they just kind of do that all the time. I don't know why. <laughs> Check your grip force. Grip force is nine. Right. Well, in biology, we just stick a Latin sounding name on everything and make every little different thing named there we go. its own. Um, fancy sounding title that we have to memorize the terminology for. <laughs> Good 
bridge nav. Can we hold position, please? Thank you. <laughs> Steve, Steve's response to my comment about the, the naming everything <laughs> was, this is the way. <laughs> it's just the way. Rocks weren't as loose as we thought they were going to be. I know. Come on, Angular Cantaloupe. Seriously. Don't you want to come with us? Yeah. It's we'll make you famous. Last time of the cruise. Well, wow, those ones right there at the front. To the left of the lasers. Aye. Any of those two? Try those. Did you try this one too? I think I did. Okay. I don't think they were. None of those. Uh oh. There it is. The pilot cam appears to be frozen. Yeah. Come on. Okay, watch your leftward swing there. You're getting a little Copy close. that. over here. I'm not seeing a lot of loose rocks. Is there any that I might have not poked yet? No, I think you, I, I think you poked all the candidates I saw. Yeah. Um, might poke a little harder. Okay. Give it a good bonk. We'll just try and grab one, see if it comes loose. Use the force, Ren. This is the way. <laughs> I can grab one of the angled ones right there. In the try and grab one of those, see if it breaks out. Okay. Come on, what the? Atalanta has got some oh, danger. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, wiggle a little. Oh. Yeah. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Look at all those loose rocks. Nice. Okay, hold on, let me reposition. I think that other one right there was also loose now too. Yeah. The force worked. Good job, Ren. Yeah. Proof force always works, right? Percussive maintenance. Okay, you're gonna have to be quick now. Or got Copy that. Ready to get pulled off. Open up. Shoot, come on. Dan, I'm having trouble getting that angle. Do you want to give it a go? No. Nope. You want me to move <laughs> us back down, Dan? I'll reposition here. Okay. Probably go down to the seafloor. There we go. 
right, grab one up. Chance. Ah. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna go back. I gotta come up. Uh, yeah, you can move us back 20 now. Bridge now. Can we have two zero meters? Uh, two zero five, please. Thank you. Okay, question on the chat. What are the main rock types found in this area? So first you get the, you have basalt, which are what all of these little seamounts, geos, atolls are primarily Don't made of. Don't put that toy up yet. You're gonna you haven't got your rock yet. Mm. So you don't get off that easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so first you have basalt. Then on top of that, after uh, it's kind of the volcano has subsided, um, you start to accumulate this second type of rock called ferromanganese crust, which is the black stuff that you're seeing right now. That is the type of rock that I study. Um, it is a hydrogenetic rock, which means that it's formed out of the seawater and onto hard substrate. So right now it would be like basalt. Um, but it can also accumulate on other things as well. And then on top of that, you have this kind of whitish sediment layer on top of that. So one igneous rock, two sedimentary rocks. Do we ever see exposed gapro down here? Um, I have not actually. Uh, I think. Okay, get I ready. I think it might be a little bit <sighs> weird to see Hold Gabbro gotta, in the middle of a tectonic again, plate. Quite. Sure. Because um, I'm not really sure what would uplift it. I think most of the Gabbro that we have has been kind of like cord samples yeah. or samples that we see on land of uplifted. Gabbro. And Gabbro is more or less the same chemical composition as basalt, just different. It's intrusive and, it and is, so it's yeah. just a different crystal structure, correct? Exactly. So there's igneous rocks. You have two different types, which are volcanic and um, plutonic. So something like uh, Gabbro is going to cool inside, uh, kind of like inside Earth's crust, essentially, it doesn't ever extrude. So because it has such a long time to cool, you're gonna get these really, really big crystals because um, it's gr like cooling slowly, you get to grow more crystals as opposed to something like basalt where everything is pretty microcrystalline or even glassy. Um, because it cools in such a short amount of time, the crystals don't have time to grow. So uh, you can actually look online and see the different intrusive and extrusive types of volcanic uh, or igneous rocks. So another rock that a lot of people think about um, is granite, and then that is an intrusive rock, and then its extrusive counterpart would be rhyolite, and then the glass form of that would be obsidian. And those are all the same chemical composition. Um, but just kind of different forms. The glass form of granite is obsidian? Huh? The glass form of obsidian is, or the glass form of granite is obsidian? Yeah. I didn't know that. It's a very uh, silicic rock. High silica content, very viscous.
you know, what's the glass form of basalt? Uh, honestly, we just we just call it like volcanic glass. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't have a cool name like obsidian. The thing is for rhyolitic um, eruptions, because it's so viscous, you get these very explosive kind of events um, that make it cool really quickly. So you can actually get like full rocks that are just 100% obsidian. Another five, that should be enough. Whereas in these more basaltic flows, since it's uh, less viscous, you can have, I mean, you can have many different types of flows in any type of rock, but um, you can kind of go between kind of like microcrystalline to glassy in one rock. Thanks. I yeah. didn't, didn't know all of that. Coralie, do you have a favorite rock? Um, I, yeah, I actually do like volcanic glass. I think it's really cool. Um, sometimes you can get these bands of iron in them. So you can and have another uh, couple more meters down. Uh, especially in obsidian. So Copy. you call that mahogany obsidian where it has these kind of like reddish brown bands in it. Sometimes you can even see full quartz crystals in the obsidian, which is really cool. And like that formed at the same time or that was a, or an inclusion? Um, it would probably be an inclusion. Yeah, it's kind of like the in South America where they have green obsidian. Okay. My, uh, I think my favorite volcanic rock is pumice because it floats. You know, another <laughs> arm attempt. Pumice is pretty cool. I got, I got, I got, rock I got, I got, my world. Copy. <laughs> it's one of those strange things you can find out here in the Pacific is you can get eruptions that form huge lava, um, pumice rafts and just you can be sailing around generally the South Pacific and come across like massive rafts of floating rock all across the entire ocean surface is covered in floating rock. Do another 20 Lynette while we're waiting. That's cool. So there's also um, this other really cool type of rock. They're called popping rocks and They've only been documented somewhat recently, but it's a volcanic rock that um, kind of similar to pumice that it floats. Um, but a lot of times they'll bring them on board. And once they bring them on board, they start to pop because they have all of these volatiles in the vesicles. Um, so they call them popping rocks. Well, that's cool. That is cool. And uh, the next cruise I'm going on, that's actually what we're going to study, so I'm very excited Ooh. for that. Got one of the ones you've already broken loose up there. I almost got this one. Okay. Is there a difference between obsidian and helenite? And what? Helenite? I don't know what God. helenite is. <laughs> on the porch. Sitting right there for you. Oh, very cool. Well, it looks like helenite is known as Mount St. Helens Obsidian. So, it's a class of obsidian. Oh, helenite. Okay, I get it. Yay. There we go. Oh. There's a rock. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Good job, Ren. Can we take a victory roll, please? Great. Stick nice. in the box. <laughs> you got it. Two large starboard bio boxes are open. Roger. And that's one of the I most in place rock collections I've ever seen. Yeah. We were trying to collect volcanic glass once in the Marianas. Um, oh. And had these little fingers where it had like thrown it out and it was very glassy and every time we tried to pick it up with the middle plate arm it just shattered. Yeah. So we ended up extending the, well, Deep Discover has a specific rock boxes out forward um, that are open and we actually extended the rock box out, stuck it under the, um, the glass toe of lava toe and then just came up and pulled off the entire thing straight into the box.
Nice. Um, when it worked really well. Sure. That's a smart way to do it. <laughs> oh. How'd your action go, Katie? Uh, 150 middle schoolers. Okay, I'm halted. Nice. Oh, I know. I was really disappointed. I was like, yeah, this is going to be a really fun interaction. But that's all right. Hopefully they'll reschedule. Okay, one of the questions is, <clears throat> is there anything in particular this dive is looking for? And we're pretty much just trying to do, uh, what does Brian say? Baseline characterization. characterization of the deep sea. We do have some specific things that we like to sample. So we're looking for, in terms of rocks, uh, we're looking for, we're calling them angular cantaloupe shaped rocks. Um, but Essentially, we're looking for fresh, unaltered basalt samples so that we can uh, date some of these, the geology of this area. Um, and then I think in terms of biology, they're looking for any new or interesting species, anything that might be hard to ID. Um, and then no, we data. took sediment core, and uh, that is looking for... Oh, that is looking for uh, you get that sample number? Otolith, Roger, Roger. otoliths in the sediment and also macrofaunal. And I think there's some scientists ashore who are interested in that. But um, this area is up for, what is it? It's, it's po po potential <laughs> to become a yeah, national marine sanctuary. Um, and so any sort of information we can provide uh, is useful in making some of those decisions. Yep. Yep, this is that unbranched pr uh, primnoid. primnoid. Okay. Yep, uh, Norella. All right, that's good, thank you. Corley, how did we how do the viewers at home Google popping rock? The rocks that you're going to study? Uh, Google popping rock geology or um, popping rock mid ocean ridge. Um, you should be able to get, get it that way. We picked up a uh, pop rock right there on Cascadia. Oh, really? Yeah, not very far out of Astoria. That's awesome. Yeah, so my lab mate is working on samples from NA-92, which was in the Revia Higelo archipelago region. Um, and so that has some popping rocks as well. So yeah, Nautilus has actually been able to pick up some popping rocks, but I know they're, Dan probably knows this better than I do, they're very fragile. We picked up one with Sebastian that was uh, had a whole bunch of glass on a hard rock. 
geologist chipped away at it in the lab for days. Mm -hmm. I've got uh, not even a coffee cup size of glass off of it. And we're going to go put it in a, grind it up and get the gas out of it. And the rest of it wound up in my garden. <laughs> The ultimate pop rack candy. Mm -hmm. Don't mix it with soda. Right. <laughs> yes, mix it with soda. <laughs> uh, Nautilus does not uh, suggest anyone to eat any sort of rock. <laughs> <laughs> so. Speaking of rocks, we had a nice little ceremony last night and inducted oh. <laughs> a, a whole bunch of the new people into the order of the rock saw. Uh -huh. Corley, what was your uh, order of the rock saw? I am the matriarch. Yeah, nice one. <laughs> what was yours, Katie? Rodeo queen. Rodeo queen? <laughs> yeah. All right. Chris, what was yours? Uh, I don't know. I haven't got it yet. Oh, yours is on um, in the social lounge. Okay. We're going to check it out after this. I love how official they were with, like, Dwight signing them, Adam signing them, <laughs> Brian signing them. <laughs> then we have, like, page protectors over them from Dave. Very official. Oh, so uh, one of the best studied submarine glass samples from the Mid-Ocean Ridge system is the so-called popping rock. Very cool. Thanks for the update. And Friday Harbor students are wondering if there's a 3D scanner on board that is used to create 3D large print models of smaller creatures. Yeah, um, iPhone 12, 13, and 14. <laughs> Yeah, so generally we don't use a, a laser scanner or anything. We use structure for motion um, for any kind of scanning needs like that. I will say, though, it is difficult to do um, structure for motion on a moving ship a little bit. You can take the stills okay, but if you actually try and use video, it's a little rough. I tried really, really hard last time I was at sea to make some really high resolution models of coral samples we brought up. And just, it was hard to do on a pitching ship with not ideal lighting because we didn't come out with the lighting equipment and stuff to, and the spinning tables and all that to make life easier. And we were able to get some, but, uh, um, but it's much easier to do on a more controlled environment. Megan's been trying really hard to get the whale bones 3D scanned, and it has not been working out very favorably. She's using her new iPhone. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> With the LiDAR sensing capabilities. Yeah. Megan has the newest iPhone on the ship, I think, with the LiDAR thing. Just Listen. got it before we left port. Yeah, it's super impressive what all it can do. It is a little bit interesting because I don't know how having LiDAR on an iPhone is such a specific need. <laughs> uh, I feel like I'd use it relatively frequently. I'm just too cheap to ever buy the latest and greatest iPhone. I know, yeah. same. I buy, refurb I buy used refurbished phones, two years old. I'm a grad student, so I just buy whatever's the cheapest I can <laughs> afford. <laughs> but not cheap enough for a flip phone, as we discussed last night. Yeah, I do like to take pictures, so I at least want that. I don't know why I'm really struggling here. Do I need to wait for the ship, I guess? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Our downward looking camera. So thanks for the suggestion, Friday Harbor. I'm not sure if Megan can abscond with uh, four whale bones, <laughs> but that would be really funny. Hopefully she'll get a good scan when we get back to shore and the boat stops moving. Would it be helpful to have a scanning table in that, a rotating table? For a I would imagine so. I know she downloaded um, like two different apps to try it out and it, I think it was just the movement of the boat was making it very unsuccessful. But I've never 3D scanned anything. Yeah, I've had hit and miss. I've, yeah, I've struggled with small objects. <coughs> the, the lack of two-dimensional structure or three-dimensional structure on like planar corals and small objects, I've struggled to get good resolution things. I find it easier to work actually in the real world where it has more depth of field. I think it does better that it can use background images as tie points uh, and it gets a better structure based on that. Here's another primnoid. Oh, good size primnoid. Got, looks like it's got multiple brittle star associates, probably two different groups of brittle stars even. I come down just a couple meters so I can, and I come close to the wall here and if it pulls on me it'll blow it out. Actually, looks like we've got two different types of brittle stars and a sea star eating the primnoid. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Friday Harbor says it's gonna, uh, it'll be willing to jump on a plane with the 3D scanner. Okay, is it in there, please? Got it tight on the sea star there. Yep, thank you. We'll meet you in Honolulu, Friday Harbor. What? Is that a... Is that... Stomach? <laughs> is it stomach out? Probably. Yeah, it's, it's got its stomach wrapped around that, uh, around that branch. It's digesting the coral. Definitely one of those things that humans seem to find really weird. Disgusting. <laughs> 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 All right, science is happy, thanks. Was that full of zoom there, Daryl? Okay. All right, there you can go wide now, thanks. No, this is actually a, a clipper for us, the same one we sampled earlier, but yeah, I agree, that gold skeleton. I'm used to these things having a blacker skeleton. But no, this is definitely not uh, a chrysogorgid. Oh, there's two different goals. There's like there's the chrysogorgids, and then there's gold coral, uh, which is a zoanthid, a kulamanamana. Um, yes.
you've been listening um, to his last couple dives, you've heard me talk a little bit about the analogy of exploring seamounts being equivalent to taking a hike at night with a flashlight. Mm -hmm. um, and the Atalanta view right now is a really great in, uh, illustration of how much seafloor we're actually seeing um, and all that blackness and just that little flashlight of light coming off of Hercules being that strip up a few thousand meters, wandered back and forth a little bit, being the entire route in which we're characterizing a seamount based on. I stepped out of the control van earlier. I made the terrible mistake of walking by the galley vent and smelled the Ooh. bacon. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Let me take a quick zoom on the coral before sure. we leave. Go ahead, Daryl. Yep, that's that Norella whip we've seen several other times here. Thank you. Got a little sponge in there too. Argus doesn't have lights on it, right? It does. It does? Yep. Okay. That's that lower loom you see in the bottom that's when is from all from Atalanta. Oh, okay. But yes, I'm pretty sure Argus definitely does have lights, right? Yeah, Argus itself has uh, some big boomers. A little bit stronger than Atalanta. Yeah, oh yeah. Yep, same thing. This is another one of the Primnoid whips. So at the end of this move, how would you all feel about starting to tack back and forth a little bit? Sure. Oh, hurt can. I don't know about the rest of us up here. Are you talking about holding the ship and wandering around on the tether? No, I'm talking about uh, tacking with the ship. So doing, I don't know, 100 meters kind of east and then backing up 100, you know, 
northwest. Oh, zigzagging up the hill. Right? Yep, zigzagging up the hill. Yeah, it works for me. One of our online viewers says he understands your analogy of the flashlight, Brian, but he's not sure if he'd want a cabin full of people uh, in his earphones. I'm saying I would like to have people, even if they were like just talking to me via headset on any hike. Got it. Especially if I'm going alone at, in the dark. Say zero seven zero. I'd say zero seven zero. Uh, Roger. Yeah, I'll we'll creep along the wall here for a minute. See what we get. Okay, I think we're good. So to the students of Friday Harbor, they want to know, do we encounter a lot of marine life at this depth? Certainly, um, it depends on this place. Ah, this is new yes. for this dive. Pretty. Yeah, it's a big bamboo coral. So to Friday Harbor, if you, um, yeah, every place is different. Um, yesterday we had a big deep water dive, or was it two days ago now? My days start running together. We're right at the tail we end. We just too. Ran into so many giant that, massive Brian? corals. I was just asking for a tighter, a good tight shot on this one before we re left. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Pause in. Yeah, sorry. Back to that question. Yeah, absolutely. This this is a good depth for corals. Um, you know, anywhere between about twenty four hundred and um, and shallower really can get into some really great patches of coral. All right, that's good enough for me, thanks. Um, okay, you can go away. We, uh, this site appears to just have a, not as much current flow as I would have expected. 
and so I think that's keeping um, the abundance down. But as in the last hundred meters or so, we've even started picking up. We've seen several, two different, at least two different species of Flipophora, a couple of Norellas. Now we're getting some bamboos. There's some, I guess, early signs that as we move up, uh, and I'm guessing probably get a little closer to about 1,800 meters. I'm optimistic we're going to pick up some more um, coral and sponge life. It's one of the reasons we're, so we've been basically going straight up the hill, and now we're going to start tacking back and forth, covering more area per depth um, to get a, basically a little bit of a higher resolution um, idea of where the corals start showing up in greater abundance here, if they start showing up. As I've said a lot of times before, we're really pretty good at knowing where we're not going to find corals. We're still a little, still a little ways away from being really good at f predicting where we're going to find corals out here. Can you tell what the current on the bottom is doing from the surface? Nope. Um, so. The, the way you measure current, uh, for the most part, or remote sense it, is uh, using what's known as an, AD, an ADCP, or Acoustic Doppler Current Profiler. And um, the uh, different frequencies have different resolutions and different depths. Um, but this, the longest range commercially available one I'm aware of uh, is a 38 kilohertz system that uh, only reliably gets data down six, seven, eight hundred meters at most. So while well, we can get you know deep current still, but not all the way this deep from the hull mounted systems. Um, you can also deploy these things on landers and, and on wires and stuff like that and measure down here, but you have to bring the transducer down um, kind of with you. Right. Having a current measuring device on these ROVs would be really helpful. I would be for my kind of work, absolutely. How far off of the seafloor would you need to measure the currents? I mean, the bottom, uh, I mean, I I have multiple questions at different scales, but, you know, anywhere from 20 or 30 meters up to 100 meters really? would be great. I'd be curious, you know, I want to know kind of like the benthic boundary layer interface and how the laminar flow changes over the f feature. Um, as a, and how that's different than the overarching current in the area. So being able to compare what's right on the sea floor and what the coral's in um, up to and kind of, and then getting a baseline of what it is for the area. Um, but I would take anything I could get at this point for having really good ideas of what the currents are right around where the corals live. I'm working on finalizing a paper to submit. Should, should I probably should have finalized it? I've been out here, but I didn't. Um, mm -hmm. Where we it, we were working on a, a shallower seamount over in the Phoenix Islands, and we had we, the 38 kilohertz, or actually 75 kilohertz system on Falcor, uh, gotten pretty good readings down to about uh, 600 meters, and we were working on the seamount from 1,200 to 200 meters. So I've got reasonably good current data in the top half of the transects we did. Um, we didn't have enough sample size to do really robust statistics or anything, but the, the general patterns are that it really appears to matter. Like a couple of the taxa um, abundance really have a pretty, pretty correlation visually between some of the current regimes that we noticed on different sides of the feature. Um, but because we only had four dives. I really can't pr can't prove it statistically, but just looking using at the, it. You were using the uh, Sphinx DBL on 
Sebastian, no, to get that data? No, it was using the, the hull mounted 75 kilohertz uh, ocean surveyor or whatever um, the type, the um, Teledyne's brand name is for those things, where we had the ADCP running the entire dive. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we were measuring the currents uh, above, the, up in the water column above the bottom. So it doesn't totally doesn't tell us what's going on in, in like the benthic boundary layer and stuff where the corals are actually experiencing it, but it does give us the overall sense of flow across the seamount and how you could definitely see the different sides of the seamount had different current flow um, directions and um, velocities depending on the overarching flow in the area and how it was flowing around things. So the current flow there is almost at that depth is exclusively east-west and it alternates east east to west, west to east by different depth layers. And so there was a lot more flow on the north and si south sides of that feature um, because the current was flowing past it, whereas the east and west sides was much lower velocities and much more turbulence because uh, the, the current was either hitting it and going up or hitting or more spiraling down uh, in a turbulent flow on the other side of the current. And we saw a lot of different um, taxa that, that seemed to be preferentially on the north and south faces together or on the east and west faces. The downward looking DBL on the ROV, that you can't get any current data from that? I've never tried, but it's that's so close and there's so much move, movement coming off the thrusters, I would be uh, oh, yeah. I would be worried about getting a lot of movement. You averaged it out enough, maybe, um, but those would end up being pretty big bin sizes. I guess the ROV, just the displacement of the water from it moving around. Exactly. If you're only measuring, you know, the one or two meters below the vehicle. Right. Are we happy with zero seven zero? We want to keep moving in this direction. Seems to have kind of flattened out for the. Yeah, know, we're sort of more there. or less moving parallel to the contours. Yeah. Yeah, let's give it one more go, and if if it is stays sand, we'll go back the other way. Okay. Because we can also totally tack the other way um, if we think it's going to be any steeper. I think I can't really read the bathymetry at this level of resolution.
resume whip, please. Sure, go ahead, Daryl. Yeah, this, this Norella whip is really the uh, dominant coral around here. All right, thanks. A little guy right here to the left. Don't, I don't see it. But let's take a look. Oh, it's a sponge. We like sponges. Is it? It's a sponge? I can't tell what it is. Is it in there, Daryl? Sponge. Dead sponge, I believe. Formerly known as sponge. <laughs> okay, right, thanks. Go white, thanks. Another whip right here too. It's funny I'm seeing them more in their shadows than I am on the actual thing. Yeah, that's the same Norella. The thing that kind of messes with my head about the ecology of a place like this, like we saw that one giant bamboo, like big healthy giant bamboo, which is clearly old and has plenty of food um, for it to have gotten that big. So why is why aren't there more corals here? Um, if that one bamboo could survive, what's so magical about that one particular rock it's sitting on? Um, and or why haven't other corals been recruited here? Well, I guess that's the question is, is it a recruitment su larval supply? Like, are they not larval not finding it here? Or are they finding it impossible to live here once they do um, land here? So those are two different questions. How long did the larva survive in the water column? Depends on the species. Um, and it can, we're, we're, for the most part, we don't have a good sense of that across all of them. Um, some deep sea taxa have been known to survive in the water column a long time, others probably a short period of time. So that probably controls a lot of the distribution we see of the deep sea coral is that exact question. Are we thinking we want to no. move back west? Yes. Yeah, this direction <laughs> looks like a bad choice. Okay. Question for Brian from New York. Um, a viewer was hold noticing. Your, hold your delta there. I'm sorry, Kate. No, 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 you're good. A viewer was noticing that so many of the deep water fish look old and ragged in comparison to the smooth and shiny shallow water fish. Do we know why this is? Are they actually old? Um, or is there just no evolutionary pressure to be smooth and shiny? Um. I don't know if they're old or not. My guess is is they don't see real well, so I think they run into things. Um, you know, they're kind of, they're tactile. If the rocks aren't moving, they don't feel pressure waves from them, and I think they probably often bump into things, spook, shoot, and then might shoot into the seafloor again. We see them do that when we scare them. They often, you know, dart somewhere and then dart right into a rock and then spook again and then <laughs> dart again. And I think that can leave a lot of scratches on them, one. Two, they're probably metabolically replaced their scales very slowly just because the metabolisms of deep sea organisms are often slow. And so it doesn't shed its scales and replace with new scales as often as some of the shallow water fish. Um, and I think lastly, they're, they're, they're ambush predators. They're not fast. And so they don't need a lot of um, hydrodynamic smoothness or whatever like you see in tunas or some of the shinier um, fish. And then the shiny fish in shallow water also use the reflection of the water or the light uh, as camouflage sometimes. So it's probably multiple fold 
um, things that all lean to why they kind of look as scruffy as they do. Awesome, thank you. That's interesting to hear that it might be because they bump into things. I'm sorry, Lynette, what was the bearing now? Roger. They should be able to come around to 290 now. Oh, I lo oh, there it is. See the China cops? So this is always a crowd favorite. The China cops. It's a type of coffin fish. Oh, so cute. Which is a f also a type of angler fish. You can see right between its eyes that little lighter color is its lure. It's pretty short. These are ambush predators. They just sit on the bottom and wait for something to swim nose to its mouth. You, sometimes it'll draw it in with that lure. And they open the...
couple more of our little primnoid whips that are definitely the dominant thing we're seeing around here. Thanks, Daryl. So we've been chatting with the um, scientists ashore, and I think we'd like to sample this whip thing we've been seeing a lot of at some point. So whenever you're in a good spot to think about sampling one and we see one. Like this guy here or no? Um, I can't see this one well enough yet. I think, the, I think this one's dead, but the one that was oh. just out of frame top left would be the I think was the right one. That one appears to be dead. Yep, not that one. <laughs> But that uh, one. Top right. Roger. And we can we can try a snip and slurp on this one if we want. Sure. Zoom there first down. Turn that thing on for a minute, see if we can blow some of that dust out. Right. There, it's probably sucking more stuff in. Say again, the power level. I didn't quite hear. Okay, you can turn it off. Or? It's off. centimeters, which I guess is going to be about 60% of that entire whip. Roger. Like that? More? Yeah, a little bit more. That looks good. Thanks. Yep. Perfect. Bump out on the porch for me. Copy. 
You need more? Uh, yeah. Okay. Zoom in a bit for us, Daryl. There you go, 100% there. Copy that. Okay, T4 is 100%. on the other side. Mm -hmm. There it is. There it goes. See it. In the jar. Okay. Yay. Oh, wait, T4 is off. Right. Thank you, front row. My pleasure. Do you want the porch back in? Yes, please. Copy. Jars off, right? Thank you. What was the sample number? Sample number one eight eight. Thank you. Um, you can turn your head so you're looking into the hill a little bit there for me. Take a look at this real quick. Yeah, come on down. Okay, Daryl, zoom in there. All right, that's the same clipper four we've been seeing. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Same one I followed before. <laughs> Been here before. Uh, but we didn't get to go up here. Coralie, how would you describe these rocks here? Um, covered in sediment. <laughs> <laughs> and the black part? Dusty. <laughs> <laughs> Dusty and crusty. I wouldn't say botryoidal. <laughs> like I'm not going to say it this watch. <laughs> Just trying to get it one more time. <laughs> Last chance. Yeah. These rocks right here. These are bullocky. I'm just kidding.
Ooh, it's that magical time of morning where we are about to switch over with the 8 to 12 shift. And I'm very much looking forward to some crispy bacon. Radio change. Roger. Excuse me. <laughs> so Coralie and Adam's previous watches, when he was asked similar questions, he would say, these rocks are dirty. Yeah. So we're just about to set up for a watch change here. In theory, you will get our pleasure of our company one more time this afternoon in eight more hours. Um, but in practicality, we are eating up seafloor here faster than we expected. So I don't know exactly what time we will recover. So you may not hear from the Ford 8 again. Uh, if we don't, it's been a pleasure. And uh, hopefully you'll tune in on the next expedition. Yeah, yeah. And we'll leave you with this really nice Patriotal. Good morning. Stay in soon enough. Now we got a couple, a couple of these Primnoid whips, uh, Chanakops, and uh, Chrysogorgia. Oh my here. God, a Chanakops! <laughs> <laughs>